It's Wednesday night at the Resurrection Center, and Dave's at home in bed. <sighs> I don't want to do anything today. I have anxiety, I have depression, the job, the family. Oh, I don't feel like doing anything. I don't want to do anything. I just want to end everything and just forget about everything. I don't want to live life. I just want to be home, in bed, and just end it all. Is that how sometimes you feel? Do you sometimes have a feeling like that? It comes in many different ways. Sometimes people struggle, and it could be with their spouse. It could be in their job. It could be with friends and family. And then eventually, as you cave in, the friends and family go away. Is this the kind of life that you want to live? Do you feel total despair that you don't have a chance well, we're going to talk about that tonight. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministries at the Resurrection Center. Tonight, on Wednesday, May 13th, here uh, at uh, resurrectionspringfield.org and on social media at TRC413, we'll be talking about how we feel sometimes. Sometimes we feel weak. Sometimes we feel powerless. Sometimes we feel alone. This gives us the emotion of unprotected, defenseless, and vulnerable. What should we do? That is the question. Tonight's message, the title is, We Have an Enemy. What to do about it? Yes. You don't have to be in this bed. You don't have to be stuck here. You can be out of this mess. We have an opportunity that God has given us. We can go beyond what is there. Ephesians 6.12 tells us that we have an enemy. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Did you hear me say the heavenly realms? It is true. You see, the enemy, the fight that we have is not against each other. God did not design us to fight against each other. When we talk about the church body, we don't talk about a boxing match. The fight is against the darkness in this world. The fight in the war, in the battle, is spiritual. It is not physical. Let's talk about that for a moment. There are those that understand the physical world. Well, that's an easy thing to understand because we're born into it physically and that's what we're so used to. That's an easy thing to understand. The problem that we have as carnal flesh is we don't understand the spiritual. We miss an understanding of the spiritual. You see, the devil would want you to believe that he doesn't exist. The devil would want you to believe that there is no spiritual world. Why? Because if you don't believe that it exists, then you don't know how to fight in it. So, we're going to talk about this battle that you can win. Do you like to win battles? Those that watch football games on TV or their soccer matches, yes, everybody likes to be on the winning team. We're going to talk about that. We have to be aware of the spiritual attacks that come against us. You see, spiritual attacks can cause unexplained physical ailments, panic attacks, depression, Suicidal thoughts. The temptation towards sin. That's the dark path that you don't want to go into. And the spiritual discouragement. What is spiritual discouragement? Those are the backsliders. 
that at one time had a faith and then it sort of whittled away. Those are, that's a spiritual discouragement. I'm going to read again Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 that clearly defines who our enemy is and what we're talking about. Remember, I said we have an enemy and we're going to figure out what to do about it. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Did you hear me say that? Heavenly realms. So we're not fighting against each other. The battle's in the darkness. It's spiritual. It's not physical. Tonight's agenda. Strategies the enemy uses to keep you defeated. That's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about standing firm in faith. We're going to talk about ways to take up uh, the armor of God and win. We're also going to use your spiritual authority in any situation and the power of prayer. So number one, standing firm in faith. Uh, ways to take up the armor of God and win. How to use your spiritual authority in any situation and the power of prayer. But first, I'm going to tell you about the strategy the enemy uses. You see, I could simply tell you the strategy that you should use. But any competitor, when they're focused on winning, they first study the strategy of the opponent. Because if they know the strategy of the opponent, then what they're able to do is they're able to understand what they need to do to go against that opponent. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is that the, all of the strategies that the devil uses against you to defeat you so that we understand what we're fighting. So let's do that. So strategy number one, and this comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse, second, verse 7, I should say. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. The enemy instills fear. And the scripture says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. So, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So, if we have fear, where does it come from? It comes from something other than God. And who is that? That's the devil. So, that's the first thing. That's the first strategy is that you have fear inside of you that comes from the devil, not from God. So you can identify that. That's the first strategy. That's strategy number one. So what's number two? The enemy lies to you. The enemy lies to you. In John chapter 8, verse 44, the scripture says, He is a liar and the father of lies. Wow, he's the father of lies. See, the devil lies constantly. The biggest lie is he doesn't exist. That's the biggest lie. The other lie is you're defeated. That's another lie, that you're defeated. What's another lie? You can't do it. You're not worthy. You should give up. Those are lies. The problem that we have is if we believe that, then that strategy is effective. We have to be aware of that. That the enemy is the father of lies. Let's go to strategy number three. Number three. The enemy tempts you to sin. In James chapter 1 verse 13, James chapter 1 verse 13, the scripture says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Let's talk about temptation. Let's first talk about free will. See, what God has given us is free will. So, we have the choice to go in the path of light, or we can go in the path of darkness. Now, the enemy would want you to believe that you're being tugged, that it's not up to you, 
that you have no control to go towards the path of darkness. But whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, you do. See, and that's, I'm going to read that scripture again. I'm going to read that scripture again. Uh, where it talks about the enemy tempts you to sin. So again, that's James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted. I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. We have the choice to be in the positive. Strategy number four. So the enemy stirs up pride. And in Proverbs 13.10, Proverbs 13.10, pride leads to conflict. Okay, what do we mean by pride? Pride is that attitude that, oh, I can do it. I'm in control. I don't need anyone's help. See, the devil wants you to believe that so that you're alone. Because when you're alone, then you don't have any protection. So you don't have the church body there to protect you. You don't have anyone praying for you. Or you're not receiving the prayers that, that people are praying for you. So you have a, a liar telling you that that you can do everything by yourself. And that is not true. So we talked about so far, the enemy instills fear. The enemy lies to you. The enemy tempts you to sin. And the enemy stirs up pride. Now I'm going to tell you about the three things to do while you're standing firm in faith. Let me tell you about faith. We talked before about a little bit about sports. Um, when you watch your favorite team on television, you like to win, right? So what is faith? Faith is putting yourself on the winning team because faith is believing in God. Faith is believing that God will cover you, have favor for you, and have provision for you. That is faith. So we're going to talk about how you stand firm in faith. It's one thing to have faith. The problem that m many have is that they don't stand firm in faith. What does it mean to stand firm in faith? It's not to give up. Stand firm in faith by praising. So why do we stand firm in faith by praising? First of all, by praising God, you are recognizing that he's the coach of the winning team. When you praise God, you're pulling attention away from what the devil tries to point your way and bestow upon you. That's the first thing. You stand in faith by praising. The next thing you do to stand firm in faith is you pray for others. So why do you pray for others? By praying for others, what you're doing is you are recognizing and acknowledging, as shown in the book of Acts, the community that God put together, that is the church body. So when we pray for one another, what we're doing is we're gluing ourselves together because that is part of our protection because when we fight the enemy, we do not do it alone. That's why we pray for others because we are connecting ourselves with other like-minded people in the walk for Christ and with Christ. The third thing to stand firm in faith is by being patient. That's the hard one. I'll admit, that's hard for me. See, sometimes when you're talking to God, God does have a quick answer. And very often that answer is wait. Wait for his timing. There are many things that are happening that require your success to happen. Most of it has to do with you being ready. So the reason why you have to be patient for whatever you ask for is you have to be prepared to receive what you asked for. If you're not ready, then you will fail. God will not have you fail. So that is why you have to be patient. You're not being patient for other people. You're being patient because of your own personal delays. You see, one of the attacks we have against ourselves is our own selves. 
It's not even Satan, but tonight we're talking about Satan. So let's talk about, we talked about praising, praying, and being patient. So what do you receive when you do all of that? By praising God, praying for others, and being patient. The first thing you receive is the covering, the favor, and the provision. That means you're already wearing the jacket of success. What's the benefit of that? It's peace, love, and joy. And how are you protected? You're protecting, um, the, the pillars of your house have the angels of protection upon it so that you can sleep well at night. Previously in an earlier conversation with uh, myself and Minister Wayne LaPointe, we talked about the armor of God. So I'm going to talk about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17. I'll just read the scripture as a reminder, as a review. But it's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17, and the scripture reads, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And again, that's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17. So now let's talk about ways to take up armor of God and win. Okay, so we've been talking the past few weeks at Wednesday night Bible sessions at 7 p.m. at the Resurrection Center about the armor of God, the ways we can use it, what it is, the tactics, the keys. We've been talking about that over the past few weeks. What we're going to talk about tonight is the understanding that it's one thing to know what the armor of God is, okay? We've clearly defined it, not only tonight, but in other nights. But now we're going to talk about what do you do with it? How do you apply that? And we're going to talk about that. So let's do that. The first thing we talked about earlier tonight is to know your enemy and win. See, that's a strategy that we need to have. See, but before we greet our opponent, if I could use that vernacular, is you have to know the enemy before you can defeat the enemy. So 1st of Peter, chapter 5, verse 8, 1st of Peter, chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You might go to bed tonight, but the devil doesn't. The devil's pretty active, especially at 3 o'clock in the morning. So one of the things you have to know is that your opponent is always against you, even when you're asleep, because that's where you're the most vulnerable. You're also most vulnerable when you don't believe that the devil exists. One of the things that my wife and I do is before we go to bed, we'll have two cups of chamomile tea. We'll drink that. We'll pray. And we ask for God to watch over our dreams and to watch over our bed and have the angel of protection over our house. Then when we go to bed, we are protected. Then when the alarm goes up early in the morning, we pray again. We give thanks to the Lord for his protection. What's, what's protection, do you ask? The protection he gave us while we were sleeping so that we would have the ability to wake up and be refreshed for the next morning. So we prepare ourselves for sleep before we go to sleep, and then we give thanks for the protection after we wake up. So our battle with this act, with this prayer, is all about being aware that even when we're asleep, we're still under attack. That's very important to be aware of. Number two, 
Take the sword of the Spirit and win. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the sword, which is the word of God. I stumbled on the word, so I'm going to read that again. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You see, the Bible has all the teachings and the principles in it that gives us the, enemy, and the, 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 the winning tools to beat and defeat the enemy. The issue is, is, is here. The Bible is a very large book. The Bible has 66 books in it. The book of Genesis, the Revelation, and many pages. Written 2,000 years ago. Actually, in God's heart, obviously, long before that. But the point is this. It is something to be studied. It is something to be meditated. It is not the kind of book that you just read and you understand. That's why we have Bible sessions, to give revelation and understanding. That's why we have Sunday church service, so that we become more aware of what's in the Bible and what's intended that the Bible have for us in, the today, in today's modern world. So when I talk about having the Word of God, it's more than just reading the book because it's a very complicated book. But even when you're not in the church or when you're not watching to this broadcast, you're still reading because you can meditate and receive revelation from the Holy Spirit as to what you're being told. But that's the balance. So it's an investment in time. It's an important investment in time. So that's what I mean by number two, take the sword of the Spirit and win. The sword of the Spirit is the teachings and the principles in the Bible. Number three, take the shield of faith and win. And I'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be, be, I stumbled on the words, I'll read it again. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery dots, darts of the wicked one. The fiery darts. Those are the attacks from the enemy. If you stay true to, your, to God's word and you receive the Holy Spirit, and you stay immersed in the teachings and the principles that are in the Bible that we also learn in Bible sessions and weekly church services and, and fellowship meetings, then, then you have the deflection. You have the ability to not have the wool be pulled over your eyes. You have the ability to be protected in a way that the devil cannot win. Number four, stand firm and win. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 14 says, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when, you, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. The notion is this. What we get from Christianity, and when I say Christianity, I'm talking about what we learn from the Bible and what we study from the Bible, what we meditate from the Bible, and what we receive, most importantly, from the Holy Spirit. It gives us the confidence. Why do we have the confidence? It's because we have awareness. What does awareness give us? It gives us the ability to understand what the devil's trying to do and how to overcome that. That's the advantage. So what have I talked about so far? When I was talking about ways to take up the armor of God and win, we talked about know your enemy and win, take the sword of the spirit and win, take the shield of faith and win, and stand firm and win. Now I'm going to tell you how to use your spiritual authority in any situation. See, that's what we just talked about. We just finished ways to take up the armor of God and win. Well, by taking up the armor, what do you have? You have spiritual authority. 
So now we're going to talk about how to use your spiritual authority in any situation. The first one is use your authority for physical protection. And this is in Psalms 91.10. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. And also for number two, I'll just include that. Number two is use your authority to drive out sickness. So not only can you be physically protected through prayer, that if you already have an ailment, you can pray for it to be rebuked and removed out of you. Power of prayer is amazing. And I've seen it. I've seen the power of healing through prayer. So number one is use your authority for the protection, the physical protection. And number two is to use your authority to drive out the sickness. I'm going to go a step further with number three. We talk about use your authority to drive out sickness. Number three is use your authority to cast out demons. That way you're not possessed. Mark 16, 17, the scripture, Mark 16, 17. They will cast out demons in my name. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I cast out demons that are in my house. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. We have the angels of protection on the pillars of our house from the roof to the basement, from the front to the back, from the side to the other side. My wife and I, we pray for that. We pray for that in the evening. Remember, we talked about the evening prayer. And in the next morning after we wake up, we give thanks. So for number three, your authority to cast out demons. You can use that. Number four, this is an interesting one. Use your authority to subdue the weather. I'm going to read the scripture before I explain what I mean by subdue the weather. Then he arose. This is in Mark chapter 4, verse 39. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. This has very little to do with 22 news and the weather. It has more to do with the atmosphere in your household or the atmosphere that is presented to you at your job. So when we talk about the weather, we're talking about the storms in your life, the atmosphere, the thickness in the air. That is what we're talking about. So you can use that authority. Say, dear Jesus, dear Lord, put peace and calm into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord. Make this a great day, Lord. Let no distractions be be bestowed upon me in Jesus' name. Declare that before you enter your workplace or if you go to school, before you go to school. Declare that. So you can use your authority to subdue the weather of the atmosphere. Number five. This is a good one. Use your authority for finances. Finances. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. The scripture says, He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. What are we talking about? The, the idea is this, is that we have control what is in our basket. We have control what's in our harvest. What the scripture was referring to was the stewardship, that means your responsibility, to manage what is in your basket. Dear Lord, I pray that I'm a good steward of our finances. Let me not be wasteful, and let me be trustful in Jesus' name. You can pray for that. You can ask that you be a good steward in your finances. It is amazing the waste of money that are in households. The next thing I'm going to talk to you about is the power of prayer. The power of prayer. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak words, may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So what is the meaning of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20? Number one, be alert. Be alert of attacks. We talked about that tonight. Number two, pray for you and for others because it's the church body that protects ourselves. Study the Bible is number three, but also meditate in the Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit for revelation. Also ask um, that you be available for Bible sessions, for the church service. Listen to your spiritual leaders. Accept the guidance. Accept the correction. Be open. And the last one, More importantly, be guided by the Holy Spirit. It's the best gift that God has given us. So in prayer, ask for to be to accept the Holy Spirit. But not only to accept the Holy Spirit, but to believe in it. To believe in it. To know that God is real. The next one, to receive. Ask God for your covering, favor, and provision so that you can receive the blessings that God has for you. And the reason why is you want to have the peace, love, and joy. Why? Because God wants you to have that. God wants you to have that. And always ask for protection. Tonight we talked about the angels of protection on the pillars of the house. Tonight's title was, We Have an Enemy, What to Do About It. We talked about the strategy the enemy uses to keep you defeated. We talked about standing firm in faith. We talked about the ways to take up armor of God and win. We did a little review. We talked about how to use your spiritual authority in any situation. And we also talked about the power of prayer. In my beginning of Tonight's conversation, you saw the little crying baby on the bed. Well, not tonight. Tonight, you learn something. Tonight, as you get ready to go to bed, you'll be able to pray and ask the Lord, Dear Lord, I ask for your covering, your favor, and provision. Lord, let peace, love, and joy flow through my house. I ask for the angels of protection, the angels of protection on the pillars of my house. And Lord, protect my neighborhood, Lord. Protect my finances, Lord. Lord, let me be a good steward of my finances, Lord. Let me not be wasteful. And Lord, let me be attentive to the needs for my physical health. Have me eat what I should eat and not eat what I should not eat. And let me get the, the physical care that I may need. So, Lord, as I go to bed tonight, watch over my pillow, watch over my head. And be protective of me, Lord. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center. <laughs>